Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to something entirely different. Today we will be talking about the book series The Beast Arises, and more specifically, the lore found inside of it. I'll be using this as a bit of a test bed for the upcoming Horus Heresy series, so if you have any suggestions to make, then please do post them in the comments below. There will be virtually nothing in the way of art for this, because there is practically no art made for this particular period of Imperial history, and that's also why it's so interesting, because there's also practically no lore about this period. Without further ado, let's get on with it. And let us start with talking a little bit about the book series itself. So, The Horus Heresy, as many of you know, is a massively successful series. In fact, you could probably go so far as to say that it is by far the most successful series of books Black Library has ever released. Hell, I might even go so far as to say that it's one of the most successful things that Games Workshop has ever done. It has brought the glorious light of 40k, or, well, technically speaking, 30k, to thousands upon thousands of new people. And unlike much of Warhammer 40k, it has been accepted into normie culture. People who haven't the faintest fucking clue what 40k is might still have read the Horus Heresy. Or, well, read as much of it as has been currently released, anyways. And it is very hard to not directly compare The Beast Arises to The Horus Heresy, as, in many ways, it was Games Workshop's attempt to capture lightning in a bottle once again. And while I personally do not think that the attempt was as massive of a failure as many people would, there's quite a lot of people that absolutely despise The Beast Arises series, and... I can kind of see why, but at the same time I do think it is a valuable addition to the Warhammer 40k universe overall, even though it does have some issues here and there, shall we say. So let us start with the setting. The Beast Arises is set in a time period that has not been explored by Warhammer 40k lore at all so far. It's been a thousand years since the Horus Heresy. The remnants of the Traitor Legions have all been driven into the Eyes of Terra, with a few exceptions here and there. But the Imperium as a whole remains strong. True, the once mighty Space Marine Legions have been broken up into several smaller successor chapters, and true once again, the Horus Heresy took a fearsome toll upon these the most powerful of the Emperor's servants, but the Imperial Guard and the Imperial Navy have stepped up to take over the responsibility of reuniting and guarding the Imperium. In all due reality, the Imperium as it is now is, while not as strong as when the Space Marine Legions roamed the galaxy, it is certainly not weak. And in fact, the only true threat to the Imperium are minor incursions of Xenos, so-called Border Wars. There is, at this point in time, nothing that could threaten the Imperium of Man. The Tau have yet to become a force in the universe, the Eldar are scattered, broken, and on the long road to extinction, and the Orcs, well, the Orcs are mere nuisances. They test the Imperium's furthest borders occasionally, but they are seen as nothing more than a minor threat, an inconvenience. They are little more than target practice. The force that was once considered the greatest threat to the Burgening Imperium, a threat so great that the Emperor himself led the extermination efforts of the Greenskins' hordes, are now little more than a minor infestation of Zeno's rats. They have fallen very, very far indeed since Ulanor. And as for the forces of chaos, a threat now fully recognized within the Imperium for the massive threat to the very existence of not only humanity, but the galaxy itself, well, no one's really heard from them in a very, very long time indeed. The newly formed forces of the Inquisition constantly stumble upon new, small pockets of chaos-worshipping madmen, but nothing that could be considered even a small military threat. As for the Traitor Legions, they are assumed to have been destroyed within the Eye of Terror. 
As far as the Imperium is concerned, the only remaining traitor legions that exist within the galaxy are the Iron Warriors and a handful of warbands that desperately hold on to some minor holdings on the fringes of the Imperium, soon to be rooted out and destroyed by the remaining Space Marine chapters. They are not even an inconvenience, they are simply a formality. And in the middle of this stable era of peace and strength of the Imperium, the greatest enemy that they had to fight at the moment were nothing but bugs, quite literally. A Xenos race known as Chromes, due to their silvery colour, was sweeping through several smaller systems. These were interesting little creatures, because it did not appear that they travelled through the warp like normal civilised people. They didn't have ships, they simply appeared on the planet and then started om nom nomming whatever was around them. Previously they had been doing this for a very very long time, however, they were known as a minor threat, if even a threat at all. They were pacifist bugs. They weren't going to attack anything. They're pretty damn fucking huge, a chrome is the size of a human easily, and it has massive claws and powerful teeth. If it wanted to eat a human, it most certainly could. But generally speaking, they either stayed away from humans, or simply when they arrived on a planet that had a large human population, they would keep themselves, well, to themselves. They'd isolate themselves in their massive burrows and wait for a while. Within a few months, usually before Imperial Army reinforcements could even reach the planet, the Chromes would simply have disappeared, using whatever mysterious modus of transportation they had to slip back into, presumably, the warp. As far as the Chromes were concerned, we were a considerably larger threat to them than they were to us. Which is why it was especially baffling for Imperial authorities when the previously docile Chromes started, quite literally, invading various systems, pouring out of what was assumed to be empty dugouts onto the surface of planets, assaulting anything and everything. They were rolling like a wave through several smaller systems, flat out attacking human settlements, which was something that they had previously just simply not done. But even then, the Chromes were a minor threat. Well, again, if you could even categorise them as a threat, they were threatening one or two minor solar systems, four or five planets at the most. Nevertheless, the Imperium couldn't stand by and let a Xenos infestation grow within the Imperium. And there were other considerations. In this era of peace, maintaining a large military was becoming politically problematic, especially when it came to forces like the Imperial Fists. The Imperial Fists maintained their vigil on Terra, but, well, nothing had threatened Terra for, well, a very, very long time. Hell, nothing had even gotten close to threatening Terra. As such, having an entire chapter of Adeptus Astartes simply just chill out on the walls for their entire period of service seemed, well, somewhat pointless really. And so it was suggested that to prove that forces like the Imperial Fists were still necessary, almost the entirety of the Imperial Fist chapter, all but a single company, the so-called Wall Company, that were honour bound to stay on Terra under all circumstances, were dispatched to defeat the Chromes. 900 Adeptus Astartes, practically the entirety of the chapter, including the vast majority of its heavy support and armoured vehicles, were dispatched to crush this minor Xenos infestation. And that was exactly what they did. To an unaugmented human, the Chromes would possess a significant threat, but to the Space Marines they were practically harmless. It would, in fact, take dozens of the little bastards to bring down a single Adeptus Astartes, and that is if the giant space marine in golden plate armed with the most devastating weapons in the Imperium decided for some reason not to fight back, which, as you can imagine, was somewhat unlikely. The one advantage the Chromes possessed was that of sheer numbers. There were billions of the little bastards. And so the Space Marines were, to put it lightly, outnumbered. But seeing as the Chromes had virtually no way in hell of actually hurting an Adeptus Astartes warrior, their numbers didn't help much. 
and it appeared to be a simple question of time until the Imperial Fist had crushed the entire Chrome race between their golden boots. Even the appearance of specialized warrior forms, so far unseen amongst the Chromes, much, much bigger, much stronger, hell of a lot faster, and armed with considerably bigger claws, these warrior forms were the Chromes' answer to the Adeptus Astartes. Unfortunately for the Chromes, however, they fell far short of the mark. And while one of the Chrome's warrior forms possessed a considerably greater threat to an Adeptus Astartes, even going so far as to quite possibly killing one of the Emperor's Chosen, they were too little and far too late. Best case scenario, they delayed the inevitable Imperial victory by a few hours. However, as previously mentioned, the Chromes were a pacifist species. As such, it was somewhat disconcerting that an Imperial victory was even needed. Members of the Adeptus Mechanicum, specifically the Adeptus Biologus, were sent with the Imperial Fist and the Imperial Guard elements to try and figure out why the Chromes were acting so remarkably out of character. And speaking of the glorious Imperial Fist, we also learn about something quite special about them. Apparently, they are all given wall names. These names are, as a rule apparently, remarkably cringy. Autobot names like Firefight or Deadshot. I do believe there is literally an Autobot named Firefight, by the way, so bear that in mind. Silly kids' playground names notwithstanding, however, the Imperial Fists did not appear to have any problems with the Chromes, despite their somewhat unusual behaviour. But let's look a little bit about why the Imperial Fists were there in the first place. As mentioned previously, it was becoming politically problematic to maintain an army like the Imperial Fists purely to maintain terror. Now, in these days, after the Horus Heresy and the breakup of the Legions, the Imperium was now ruled by a council of twelve High Lords, and a gathering of lesser lords who, in all due reality, had very little actual influence on matters. Back in the day, the High Lords not only consisted of the Twelve High Lord, but a quorum, a council of sorts with hundreds of lesser dignitaries. And this large gathering of bodies voted on the most important of subjects. It was a very well-respected and efficient, well, by the standards of massive galactic-spanning government anyways, body. The new High Twelve, however, well, here's the problem. Back when the High Lords consisted of the High Twelve as a primary ruling body, and then several hundreds of lesser dignitaries, there was a certain element of productive chaos, I should perhaps say. It was impossible for any one of the High Lords to really start seeking out his own personal power at the expense of the others, because there were hundreds of others. The High Lords would of course vary in their stature within the Council, certainly, as sometimes one of them would have more political power than the other, but if one of the High Lords found himself outflanked by two other High Lords, he could make up for that by appealing to the larger quorum. As such, the powers of the High Lords as individuals were greatly diminished. This system, however, had fallen out of favour precisely because of that fact. The High Lords wanted more power, and as such, they sought to limit these discussions to only the High Twelve. This meant two things. One, the power of each individual High Lord was massively increased, and two, it meant that now only twelve people were expected to deal with every single piece of business in the Imperium. This was a job that was previously done by hundreds of people. Most of the legislative nonsense would be passed long before they actually got to the High Lords, whereas now they were micromanaging everything, which led to massive workloads being placed upon the High Twelve, which often meant that pieces of legislation and important stuff, like for example, you know, the raising of Imperial Guard regiments, would simply just get pushed further and further and further and further down the pile, while the High Lords tried to elevate their own business. For example, there was a wonderful example brought up in this book where a piece of legislation ordering the building of new Imperial Navy cruisers were given to one of the High Lord's home planet. Now, 
This planet delivered the cruisers at a greater expense and at a lower quality than their competitors. However, because the planet in question was the previous seat of government of a higher lord, he essentially gave this as a favour to his own planet. In other words, the High Lords, essentially to incur favour with this particular High Lord, had passed a bill that was actively detrimental to the Imperium. In short, the highest governing body within the Imperium had become almost entirely occupied with its own self-aggrandizement, rather than the actual running of the Imperium. We are also introduced to the High Lord of the Officio Assassinarum in this book, and he is hands down my favourite character so far. He's just wonderful. And I think I like him so much because he reminds me a lot of Inquisitor Glockta from the first Law series, which is one of my favourite characters in fantasy ever, so I am very, very fond of the High Lord of the Officio. And as such, I am extremely pleased to tell you that most of the information we get about the High Lords is delivered through the High Lord of the Officio. Back in the day, the Officio Assassinarum had one of the constant seats at the Table of the Twelve. However, they had been pushed out by the Inquisition. Two new organisations had been added to the High Lords since the Horus Heresy, that of the Ecclesiarchy and the Inquisition. And while the High Lord of the Officio certainly agreed that the Inquisition and the Ecclesiarchy deserved spots at the table, he was of the opinion that the High Lord should simply have been expanded to 14, rather than see the previous two occupants be pushed down to the lower ranking members. But again, the High Lords were doing this to increase their own power. As such, an expansion of the High Lords was not something they would want to see happen. And speaking of power, currently the High Lord wielding by far the greatest amount of influence and political power was Lansung, the High Lord of the Imperial Navy. Because without the Imperial Navy, the rest of the Imperium was, well, in deep, deep dark shit. Indeed, it has gotten so far that the supposed High Lord of the High Lords, the guy who's supposed to keep the other High Lords in check and make sure that their own political ambitions do not hurt the Imperium, the High Lord Gilliman had essentially lost all of his real political power to the other lords. He was essentially a figurehead. And it is important to note now that I am not talking, of course, about the Primarch Gilliman. I'm pretty sure that any of the High Lords would not have the sheer brass balls to stand up to him. I'm speaking of a ceremonial title known as Lord Gilliman to represent the technical position of the Primarch of the Ultramarines at the table of the High Twelve, a position previously occupied by Malkador the Sigilite, and then, as the name would obviously suggest, the Primarch Gilliman. And the Lord of the Officio explains as much. In his eyes, the High Twelve have become a highly inefficient organisation. The High Lords themselves mostly occupied with their own gains rather than that of the Imperium. And while you might think that the High Lords of Assassins would have a pretty simple solution to the problem, it was not his place to deal with the High Lords. At the very least, he was not of that opinion yet. For the Officio to actually be put into action, the High Lords would have to vote on it. Back in the day, the Officio itself had a word on who was to get assassinated, but currently, the High Lords, without the Officio having any say in the matter, would be the ones dictating who gets killed. And despite the fact that the High Lords were, in all due effect, the ones holding the leash, many of the High Lords outright feared the Master of Assassins, and in many ways tried to alienate him from proceedings, because, well, he is the Master of fucking Assassins. <laughs> you don't want to make an enemy out of him, but at the same time, you don't want to trust your back to him either. Somewhat ironically, the only High Lord that the Officio currently had a relatively good relationship with was the Inquisition, the very organisation that had supplanted the Officio from the High Twelve. And this is also the point where we get our first taste of courtly intrigue. The Inquisition has information suggesting that the Imperial Fist and Imperial Guard elements are going to be in need of immediate aid upon the planet of Ardumantua, where the Imperial Fists are currently fighting the Chromes. But they do not have enough political power to get any sort of rescue fleet to them. 
At this point in time, the Imperium loses contact with the expedition fleet sent to Ardumantua. And while losing contact with a fleet in and of itself is not a particularly rare occurrence, the Inquisition has secret information that leads them to believe that the fleet would be under threat, and now that they had lost communication, it would appear as if they might be right. As such, the High Lord of the Inquisition enlists the aid of the Officio in a dirty little ploy to force Lansung, the High Lord of the Imperial Navy's hand, forcing him to send forces to aid the Imperial Fists. The plan didn't quite work out as it was expected, however. The original plan was to paint Lansung into a corner, forcing him to send the Imperial Navy assistance to the Imperial Fists, allowing him to grandstand, saying that, oh, the Imperial Navy will come to the aid of the mighty Astartes, and then he'd bring along some Imperial Army elements to help back up the invasion fleet. Fairly minor stuff. Instead, Lansung took the opportunity to grandstand one step further. He suggested that the remaining Wall Brothers, the single company of Imperial Fists not allowed to leave Terra, would be dispatched to aid their brothers. The Imperial Fists themselves had, uh, well, leapt at the idea, would perhaps be the best way of describing at it. Being stuck on Terra, many of the brothers were desperate for any action whatsoever, even if it meant breaking their oaths to stay on Terra. Honestly, I think this is a little bit of a leap of logic on the part of the novels, because I'm thinking the Adeptus Astartes, no matter how thirsty for glory they might be, their oaths to defend Terra would almost certainly trump any order coming from the High Lords. But anyways, this allows Lansung to grandstand, because now he's essentially ordering the Imperial Fists into battle, power that virtually no one else in the Imperium has. But it leaves the Inquisition and the Officio somewhat worried, because without the Imperial Fists, Terra is not particularly well defended, not to mention that this would mean that the entirety of the Imperial Fists chapter would be engaged in one single conflict, which comes with the inevitable risk of the entirety of the chapter getting wiped out. And while that is most certainly a fairly unlikely circumstance, it is a possibility. But then again, the odds of an entire chapter getting wiped out are astronomical, and it's not like the High Lord of the Officio or the Inquisition have any real way of countermanding Lansung's orders at this point, and so they simply had to see them sail away. Hopefully, they would arrive in one piece and be able to save their brethren. If not, well, shit. And speaking of, well, shit, let us return to Adamantua. At this point, the Imperial Fists had pushed deep into the Chrome's hive structures, and it was only a question of time until the entirety of the Chrome invasion force was wiped out. However, before this could happen, the Imperial Navy and Adeptus Astartes fleet elements and high anchor above the planet began registering strange gravetic phenomena. At first, the disturbances were thought to be some manner of error in the fleet's logistical senses and their auspexes. However, this error soon became deadly, as the fleet around the planet were dragged into a gravitic storm. Entire ships were annihilated in mere seconds, as gravitic distortions manifested themselves inside of ships, turning the laws of reality on their heads, tearing apart plasma chambers, opening weapons chambers into the void, destroying the bridges of starships, and tearing apart the hull of gargantuan war fleets in seconds. In mere moments, the entirety of the Imperial fleets stationed above the planet of Ardimantua was virtually destroyed. When the reinforcement fleet arrived, they found... Well, not what they had expected. First and foremost, the planet of Ardumantua seemed to have been, well, fucked up might be the best way of describing it. The planet was virtually unrecognisable, not to mention the simple fact that they could barely see the planet through a massive debris field of dead Imperial ships and gravitic distortions. Combine all of that with the fallout from the various plasma reactors that had exploded when their ships were destroyed, it was almost impossible for Imperial sensors to determine, well, anything. 
The Imperials did, however, get a bit of a lucky break. One of the many ghost returns showing up on Imperial sensors turned out to not be a ghost at all. It was a ship. The last surviving ship of the fleet. Namely, the Anculon. The Anculon was one of the first ships to be hit by the gravitic distortion. It had hit in its engine compartment, which had almost crippled the ship and forced it to move out of high anchor. This had in fact saved it, because when the main gravitic distortions arrived, the Anculons were outside of the main wrath of the gravitic storm. Still, the ship was crippled. Beyond crippled, in fact, the ship was, in all your reality, dead. Its contingent of Imperial Fists, which had been holding back in reserves, had been deployed before the ship was... shall we say... compromised. The incident with the engine had, over the long periods between the Gravitic Storms and the arrival of the fleet, lethally irradiated the entire crew. They were, in all due reality, dead men walking. However, the Anculon could still provide vital data to the reinforcement fleet. Amongst other things, they sent news of Adamantua's new moon, an object hanging above the planet where no object should exist. And surprisingly enough, Imperial Auspex insisted it was not an object at all, as it was not corporeal. In fact, they likened it to the effect of a spaceship exiting the warp. The Anculon also sent over data detailing the gravitic disturbances that had happened before the main storm had arrived. There were many theories going around at the moment, but the primary one, having been developed by a Magos biologist on the planet, was that it was some form of communication. Now, you might be wondering how the fuck can a gravitic storm powerful enough to rip apart spaceships be communication? Well, that's a pretty damn good question. Again, the reigning theory was that it was created by some sort of hyper-advanced species who use gravity manipulation for all kinds of stuff, including communication. Seems somewhat counterproductive, but hey. The idea that it was a hyper-advanced race was due to the simple fact that they could control fucking gravity, to the point where they could terraform and affect entire planets, something that even the Imperium was entirely incapable of, or, well, the Imperium does possess basic terraforming technology, but it takes place over the course of hundreds of years. Nothing like this, which could turn an entire planet into a gravity-ridden hellhole in hours. The question then remained, who the fuck was doing this? Well, the original thesis that it was somehow the Chromes trying to communicate, or some new weapon of theirs, seems somewhat unlikely considering the sheer magnitude of the achievement. The bugs had virtually nothing in the ways of technology, and as such it would seem somewhat unlikely that they'd stumbled upon gravity manipulation by some accident. Another more plausible theory that also included the Chromes was that the massive apparent warp hole above the planet had some sort of effect on it. Obviously, the uh, suspicion immediately fell upon chaos because, you know, they tend to do shit like this, but it didn't really seem like a chaos attack. It seemed like a natural phenomenon rather than a quote-unquote magical phenomenon. Furthermore, the idea was that the Chromes were travelling from planet to planet through the warp, in some way of almost tunnelling. It was unsure how that happened, and frankly, the book doesn't really explain how the fuck the Chromes could travel through the warp, and this is one of the strange things, which maybe will be explained in later books. But it would appear as if the Chromes lived inside of tunnels in the warp. It is possible that this referred to the Eldar webway, although there is no real solid indication or evidence to suggest as such, other than the description of them living in tunnels in the warp. It was then suggested that the reason why they were flooding out and attacking Imperial space, something that they virtually never did, was because they were being forced out of their living space. The Magos biologists likened them to rats, and brought up a quaint little example of rats in a cellar in Imperial archives. Servitors had been sent down with flamers to drive them out, and once the rats figured out that flames are indeed hot, they swarmed out in their thousands and overwhelmed the servitors, killing and quite literally shredding several of them. Basically, the idea was that the Chromos were panicking, and therefore they went on a bit of a stampede into Imperial space.
The precise whys would have to wait, however. Nine-tenths of the Imperial Fist chapter were stuck on that goddamn planet, and the relief force had come to drag their golden asses out of it. As such, what remained of the Imperial Fists were sent down to the surface to look for their missing brothers. It didn't go particularly well. The relief force crashed and burned into the planet itself. Turns out that trying to fly through a field of gravity which constantly changes, thereby randomly ripping your engines out of the fucking cockpit, was apparently a bad idea. Surprise, surprise. Luckily, Adeptus Astartes are pretty damn robust, and they survived the rather rough landing, along with several members of the Imperial Guard and a heavily damaged pilot. A very heavily augmented pilot. This will be important in a bit, trust me. And now that they were down on the planet, they immediately began trying to find their friends, which they did eventually succeed in. Elements of the Imperial Fists were still fighting on the planet, fighting against the Chromes, who had been driven, well, completely and utterly berserk at this point in time, and simply attacked anything that moved on the surface. As such, the Imperial Fists had burrowed down into the Chrome's old network of tunnels. The chapter master of the Fists had been killed in one of the early engagements of the war. Apparently, he had some problems with his temper, and when he had his entire fleet destroyed and got trapped on this planet, and it looked very much so like he would be responsible for the death of 900 Imperial Fists, well, let's just say that he got a little bit pissy off it and simply just ran screaming at the Chromes. And while the Chromes might not be the most effective of fighters, there was still quite a lot of them. The Fists, already there, were quite surprised to see their brethren here, because now that meant that the entire chapter was stuck on this goddamn hellhole, which is not a very good thing, because they still had no way to actually get off the planet. On the plus side, the heavily damaged flight servitor would turn out to be very, very useful indeed. The Magos biologist on the planet had somehow survived under the protection of the auto... <clears throat> Imperial Fist Legionary, Slaughter. The Magos was the one who originally came up with the idea that the Chromes might be fleeing away from something, and that the gravitic distortion was some form of message. However, he had been incapable of actually translating the message without a medium to pass it through. He was not as heavily augmented as many of his brethren, and so unfortunately he couldn't simply just plug himself into his various machines. He had to have a cortex he could plug into and pass the signal through a living human's uh, well, brain to try and figure out exactly what it was saying. Sounded a lot like scientific mumbo-jumbo to me, but then again, I put up with random excuses like this from Star Trek for like 10 years, so I guess I can give 40k the benefit of the random scientific solution as well. But more so than the solution itself, it was the message that was the problem. The message was not one of peace, love and equality and respect for all. It was apparently orcs. Lots and lots and lots of fucking orcs. The hole in the sky above the planet of Ardimantua, the thing that Imperial Sensors kept insisting was some form of warp gate, eventually spewed out a massive moon. Except it wasn't just a dead rock, this appeared to be a moon occupied by orcs. The orcs had, as they liked to do, strapped a fuck tons of things to it, including giant cannons, missiles, and a massive gravity weapon, capable of firing rocks hauled from the planet below by some kind of gravity manipulation nonsense directly at the Imperial fleet, who now found itself embattled not only by this gigantuan fuck-off space station and its gravity weaponry, but also by dozens upon dozens of ships, cruiser-sized vessels that issued forth from the attack moon. This, to put it simply, was not what the Imperial Navy had expected. The Navy had been sent along with one or two Astartes ships, a couple of capitals and some cruisers. They were not in any way equipped to deal with something along the lines of this fucking nonsense. And to make matters considerably worse, these were not your average run-of-the-mill orcs. These orcs were very, very special indeed. They possessed teleportation technology of a hitherto unknown quantity and quality. They were able to drop hundreds of thousands of orcs directly down onto the surface virtually immediately upon their arrival. 
the handful of Imperial Fists that remained, less than a third of the entirety of the chapter, now found themselves in a desperate fight against thousands of Orcs, pouring into the Hive networks of what was once the Crow's homes. And, to make matters even worse, these were not your garden variety Orcs. I know I've said that before, but let me point out just how insane it is. These Orcs were equipped with power weapons, and highly effective articulated armour. In fact, these Orcs were not only equipped and armed to the standards of Space Marines, they were even bigger than the Adeptus Astartes. According to the Fists themselves, these were the largest Orcs they had ever seen or fought. In fact, they were likened to the Brutes that were defeated at Ulanor. The fight did not go well for the Imperium. It went about as bad as it could possibly actually go, in fact. The fleet was well, practically wiped out. A few of the ships managed to escape and bring tidings back to the Imperium. Fairly fucking grim ones. And as for the troops left on the planet, yeah, that, that didn't go particularly well either. So, let's talk about the Orcs themselves, because this is the interesting part. Actually, I had this theory long before Games Workshop came up with it, so I'm actually really happy that they have confirmed my ideas here. Because this seems once again to hint at, rather strongly, that the Orcs were creations of the Old Ones, and that they were capable of virtually infinite growth and evolution. They were now mastering gravitic weaponry. They were developing weapons and armour equal, or at the very least very close to equal, in quality to that of the Adeptus Astartes, and they were fucking massive. Again, the idea here is that the bigger the orcs get, the more powerful they get, the more of their latent powers, shall we say, they unlock. A million orcs might be able to figure out how to make aircraft, a billion orc might be able to figure out how to make spacecraft, but ten billion orcs might figure out how to make a gargantuan fucking attack moon that teleports. And honestly, this, I think, is the best part of the Beast Arises books. The books themselves are pretty decent. I quite like them, actually. I enjoy them. They're certainly not the Horus Heresy, but there's nothing particularly wrong with them. Most of the people who really don't like the books is because of their takes on the Orcs are not very orky. But as I mentioned, I actually think this makes a fair bit of sense. And it'll be interesting to see how they continue with this in the following books in the Beast Arises. I will be doing an episode like this, per book, so there will be several more videos like this coming up. And we are almost finished with the first book. The last interesting part mentions the Inquisition. They got word of the catastrophe at Ardmantua, and they decided to institute their own measures. They had lost faith in the Officio, and the Officio had lost faith in them. The Inquisition had refused to tell the Officio of why they were so worried about the forces of Ardmantua. And now that the proverbial shit had hit the fan at supersonic speeds, the Officio was very interested in figuring out what exactly the Inquisition knew. The High Lord of the Officio personally visited the High Lord of the Inquisition, by sneaking into her private security apartment and making an absolute fucking fool out of her bodyguard. One of the many reasons why I absolutely goddamn love that little bastard. He's a fantastic individual. Anyways, the Inquisition did not want to share its sources with the High Lord of the Officio. As you might guess, this pissed him off just a little bit, and he began instituting his own countermeasures. The Inquisition warned the Officio against this, saying that any action on their part might tip the fragile balance. As far as the Officio was concerned, however, they were not particularly keen on seeing the Inquisition's plans come to fruition, considering how badly they'd fucked up the original idea. Now, what happens next is a little bit unclear. Apparently, the Inquisition put out an assassination order within their own organization upon an Adeptus Arbites agent. It is worded as if it was some sort of punitive measure either against the Officio or against the Adeptus Arbites. It's not entirely clear what happened. What is clear, however, is that the High Inquisitor sent her own bodyguard to make sure that the job got done. He followed his target down into the Lower Spires and ambushed him. 
leaping out of the shadows, bowling the man onto the ground and snapping his neck in one fluid motion. Or at least that is what the Inquisitorial agent did to the hobo, now wearing the Arbites coat. The last words the agent ever heard was a silent voice from behind him. Not bad. The agent's corpse was discovered a few hours later, although identifying it took a while because, well, the corpse was headless and there wasn't a whole lot left of him to identify. And that has been the lore breakdown of sorts of Book 1 in the Beast Arises series. As previously mentioned, do leave any comments of what you think might be done better or if there's any other format you would prefer for these kinds of videos when it comes to the Horus Heresy. Do also bear in mind that on the Horus Heresy I will of course be doing lore videos on important individuals like the Primarchs obviously and large events. I'm not yet entirely sure whether or not I will do so for the Beast Arises, but we'll see. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you all again soon. Oh, and uh, Merry Christmas.